All right, welcome, Mark. Well, yes, uh, Professor Kristen Happy joins us next. He is the Director, African Center of Excellence for Genomics of Infectious Diseases of the uh, Redeemers University. So he's a genomic expert. Good morning, Prof. Thank you for joining us today on the program. Well, given the, um, you know, Thank you. information. Thank you for having me. All right, given how the rate of infectious, local infectious rates uh, raises a huge concern about this variant of concern, could you give us a picture? What exactly are we dealing with here? Yeah, we, we definitely are dealing with, um, with, uh, with another beast, which is very different from what we've experienced in the first and second wave. Uh, the, the, the present, the virus, you know, uh, the Delta virus uh, create, I mean, that is responsible for the third wave that you've seen across uh, Africa and the world is more deadlier than the ones that we experienced before. You can see the situation in many African countries. South Africa is almost 2,000% up. Rwanda is almost 1,700% up in number of cases. And there's a total lockdown there until June, July 27. We experienced huge surges in Liberia, in Sierra Leone, and then in Uganda. Many countries in Africa are locking, are, are locking down because of this surge. Within two weeks, it's very possible that you can see this variant taking over from what has been existing. So we have to be very careful. We're dealing with a the, with the dangerous beast at this point in time. In Europe, in America, we can see you know, the number of cases surging. Countries are going back toward lockdown. So we really have to be very careful because we don't have the resources to deal with the beast like the Delta, I mean the Delta, the, uh, the Delta variant. Mm. So um, those countries not too far away from us in the West African coast, why do you think uh, we haven't been hit by that kind of wave here in, in the country? Well, if care is not taken, and if we do not adhere to social distancing, wearing our mask, and then uh, adhering to all of the public and safety rules given by NCDC and the ministries of health. If we do not do that, then we are in for trouble. So it's very important that people take this seriously because in countries where this is happening, they went through the phase that we went through now, whereby they thought that, oh, no, nothing's going to happen to us. And then suddenly they find themselves in that situation. I can tell you authoritatively that the last set of samples from Rwanda that was sent to my lab at Redeemers at SG, Redeemers University, and 93% of those samples were all Delta variant. It tells you how, the, how terrible this situation is. The hospitals in Rwanda are overwhelmed. Oxygen is becoming a problem. A country as sophisticated as Rwanda is facing a challenge. You can imagine what will happen to other African countries that are not at that level of sophistication yet. But that, that's clearly a challenge. But perhaps one of the things, uh, Prof, that one may want to consider now is maybe even in the communication of this whole, you know, matter, you know, from the very, very beginning, you know, how well do you think, you know, from the authorities to the people and the various levels of uh, dissemination of information, would you say that that communication ambit has been taken, you know, on board to the people do you think it's been efficient i think the communication from government and then other stakeholders have been efficient but it has not been aggressive enough and i think we need to go back we have to be very consistent i listened to the reporting from your staff in in lagos and you can imagine the mindset of people where people say think that covid is for the old covid is for the rich covid is not for them but i can tell you and then I mean, authoritatively, from the data that we have, being a member of the Africa Union Task Force for COVID-19 in Africa, the disease is hitting much more, I mean, a much more younger population than it has happened before. The younger people are getting more infected with the Delta variant than it has happened before. So they, clearly, the young have to be very careful. They have to believe. If there is a way, they let them get vaccinated because that helps in a way. We've seen clearly that, you know, people that have been vaccinated before seem to be more protected than those that have not been. And vaccine is really, really, really protect people. But now in absence of vaccination, we have no other choice but to go back and apply the non-pharmaceutical measures, wearing our masks constantly, 
making sure that we observe hand washing hygiene, making sure that you also you know, respect social distancing. I know it is not easy, but I think you know, it is not just the responsibility of the federal government. It is our collective responsibility. Each and every one of us should take this seriously because we are not just protecting ourselves, but we are protecting our neighbors, we are protecting our communities, and eventually we'll protect this country. So let's take it as our own responsibility to ensure that we prevent the spread of this disease and especially of this deadly variant so that together we can get out of this quiet mire as soon as possible. If everybody is responsible and take this responsibility serious, we can all beat COVID-19 and get back to normalcy as soon as possible. Well, just to be clear, Prof, um, how different are the symptoms of this Delta variant compared to the first uh, one or two strains that we've had? The symptoms may, may, may appear to be similar, but the, the reality is that you get over one with the virus that is more invasive. That is the transmission rate of this virus is just about 70 times faster you know, than the previous one. So which means that your cells get over one. Everything that has to do with like your respiratory system and everything about your body get over one. And as such, you, know, you, pre you present much more sicker and that's the reason why you are seeing people having, I mean, their respiratory, I mean, they are I mean, they are respiratory distress. They are finding they find themselves very sick, very ill. The symptoms are more or less the same. People would think that you know, at some point, you know, they don't present symptoms, but when it starts, it actually moves much more faster because your body gets overwhelmed in a very in such a short time. And that's the reason why you are seeing people when they present with the Delta variant in little or no time, they are gone because you know when it start manifesting. It's so overwhelming that you don't have, your body does not really have an adequate time to start responding. And then remember, people should remember that there's really no, presently, there is really, we can't we can say that there is a real treatment for COVID and then vaccines is only the way forward. And then if we have such a situation with the shortage of vaccine that we have in the country, then we need to take non-pharmaceutical means of protection very seriously. Let's wear our mask. Let's make sure that we wash our hands. Let's make sure that we don't attend public gathering and that we don't gather. Let's ensure that, you know, we can make, uh, we can practice high, um, uh, hand hygiene or proper hygiene. Let's ensure also that we respect all of the safety rules given by government. Well, Prof, this is actually, it raises a lot more concern uh, given those uh, graphic description that uh, how you painted it. But we also found that uh, there was this recent study from China which presumably found that, uh, well, we, it did say that uh, uh, people who were presumably unvaccinated and infected with the Delta variant had a viral load within their respiratory system that uh, they said it was a thousand times higher than the amount of virus that was present among people who had been infected by the original strain of the virus. So these non-pharmaceutical measures, are they really going to be uh, that effective, at least given the rate at which this virus spreads? Yes, it is obvious that the non-pharmaceutical measures are very effective. We've seen countries like, I mean, some countries in the past, like Singapore and other countries that actually beat this virus or the, 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 the first wave just using non-pharmaceutical. It is clear, as you, as you get from the China study, that if you got vaccinated, you are better protected than somebody that wasn't vaccinated. But I think in the absence of vaccine, studies have proven that if we apply non-pharmaceuticals, if we go on and then use our mask and wash our hands and then avoid, you know, I mean, uh, use social distancing, uh, physical distancing, and avoid unnecessary gathering, you know, we can actually bring down the, I mean, the, 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 the battle of biomass in the environment, you know, at a very, very low level. So really, I think it is all about respecting this. You can see that in countries where the, that have relaxed and then we have uh, gone on and then say, oh, well, we are out of the wood. The, the beast came back, you know, in, in, with revenge. So we have to be very careful. We have to respect this. I know it's not easy, but I think that as much as uh, we can all do this and respect, you know, all the, the, the safety guidelines and respect, you know, and, and then ensure that we, 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 we don't spread the virus or we, we respect, you know, one another by wearing our mask, we are going to have the situation. We do not have to go through a third wave. If we apply all these measures, we can actually beat this virus. We can do without going through a third wave. But if we do not, if we keep believing that this is hoax and everything, then 
at least we are going to lose unnecessary, we are going to unnecessarily lose people in our communities that we shouldn't have. I think it is our individual responsibility, it is our collective responsibility. It is not just the responsibility of the government. I think, you know, the government starts with us, and I think we need to take responsibility. What kind of study is going on here in the country about this virus and those who have been infected in terms of what has been found, how do we adopt, adapt, or move forward? Well, I mean, we, I mean, you can see that, you know, we have been on top of the situation, well, I mean, somewhat, simply because, you know, um, the variant was actually discovered pretty early, and then we found more. We know exactly where they are. But then the more reason why we have to be very careful, because surveillance requires, you know, routine sampling and constant sampling, and the results are shared with the Nigeria Center for Disease Control. So the policies that you see from the Nigeria Center for Disease Control and then the Presidential Steering Committee are based on data. So the data, what makes Nigeria a bit unique and different from the rest of the world, I mean, many countries in Africa, is the fact that you know, the policies in Nigeria are guided by a lot of data, by a lot of evidence, and that really makes the country a bit unique. But then that said, you know, as they are setting the policies and then they are telling people to continue to wear their mask and then do the right thing, we should, we should continue, you know, to uh, respect those and we should continue to listen to what the public health authorities are saying because that is the only way out. A data prof, you know, there are questions that a number of people have asked around the efficacy of the vaccines against this particular strain of uh, the virus. There are those who have argued that the vaccine was just for the first strain. And this one, this Delta variant, is said to be far more uh, uh, virulent than the, the previous one. So one wonders, is it still going to be as effective against this you know, strain, or are we to wait for another? The reality is that, yes, the vaccine was designed against the first strain, but also remember that this, uh, this, this variant has a lot of similarity with the first strain. There are just some areas that, you know, along the S gene or what are called the, the spike gene that has mutated. And then that could give, you know, somewhat the possibility to the virus to escape the vaccine. But again, I want to stress the fact that, you know, it's not always the case. Once you have been vaccinated, it means that your immune system has been boosted. And then you've been given an opportunity, you know, to recognize the virus and then to fight it. What I'm saying here clearly is that the vaccine will protect a lot. If you look at numbers across the world, look at numbers in the U.S., for instance, that have covered millions of doses of vaccine. You know, the number of people that have had vaccine breakthrough are just barely 10,000 out of millions. Then you can imagine. So that proportion is very insignificant. It's less than 1%. or less, I mean, it's less than 0.1%. So that is very insignificant. So if you wanted to do, that, do those, those type of comparison, then you can see that vaccine protect. But then, this said, it is also said clearly, you know, and then we have shown that data prove that even if you are vaccinated, continue to respect, you know, wear your mask, continue to respect your social distancing, that actually makes it more better. So I think, you know, being vaccinated does not mean that you are 100% and absolutely immune. But then being vaccinated means that, you know, even when you have breakthrough infection, you know, with this variant, the, the, the disease manifestation in people that have been vaccinated is much more, you know, uh, less than people that have been vaccinated, which means that the vaccine still help you a lot, you know, to, to overcome. So, Prof, what, um, what kind of symptoms or what circumstances may play out if one is vaccinated the first time, waiting for the second dose and contracts this Delta variant compared to perhaps if they've been vaccinated twice and still contract the virus? Well, I mean, it's, it's clear that, you know, when you get, receive one dose of the vaccine, then you, you I mean, you need a second dose. With, that's what we call that boosting dose to actually boost your immune system. So when you receive only one dose, it means that your system, your immune system has been exposed. But then the level of response that you can exhibit compared to someone that has received the two doses, you know, is, way, uh, is much more lower. That's why you need a boosting dose. That, that's why we call this vaccine a prime boost, you know, vaccine. But now, when you, if you are exposed, you know, to uh, the, the, the virus after you've received the third dose, you know, it is obvious that, yes, you might get, you might, again, I put it in case, you might get sick. 
But then if you want to compare, you know, uh, the probability of somebody that has been vaccinated, you know, and, um, uh, and, and somebody that has not been vaccinated and both exposed to this virus, the probability that the person that has not been vaccinated get exposed, I mean, get sick is much more higher than the person that are not being vaccinated. So which means that, again, even though you will receive the first dose, the only way, and I think the best way to prevent exposure and then getting exposed or necessarily exposed to this, to, to this variant is to continue to the same non-pharmaceutical ways of protection that we've done before. Wearing your mask, ensuring that you are, I mean, we respect social distancing, ensuring that we respect hand hygiene and everything, ensuring that we don't just go to unnecessary gatherings. So those are very, very effective and helpful ways to augment the protection that the vaccine is already giving you, be it one dose or even two doses. So, Prof, do, does this um, COVID lab leak hypothesis affect anything in terms of research? What do you think about it? Well, I think um, I can say categorically that there are just many... Uh, what, what I call um, uh, uh, many people out there that do understand nothing about science that have turned, you know, to be scientists in social media. I mean, it is obvious, you know, uh, this, I am more than convinced, and I do the genetic of this, we sequence these viruses routinely, that this is not a lab link. I am very convinced about that because if there was, we would have found it. Because we're not just looking at the virus or the way people are looking at it. We are scrutinizing this virus. We are looking at it, you know, element by element, and then we have the whole complete map in front of us. If there was anywhere that was a, there was a gene was glued or something was integrated, we would have found it. It's more of a natural occurrence than a lab leak. That is just, you know, and I, I don't believe too much in people talking about lab leaks because they are just very, um, there are many naive people out there or people that don't understand nothing about science today that are suddenly turned to be gurus, you know, by just social media. And I think you know, you need to listen to the scientists. You need to follow the science and not people, you know, that are really uh, don't understand too much about science, but are actually peddling false, you know, theories or uh, conspiracy theories out there. So did, uh, did you, I mean, whilst you researched and studied uh, all of these processes, were you surprised that this Delta variant eventually hit? I wasn't surprised. And then, I mean, we, 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 I wasn't surprised. And then this might not, I say, might my word, might not be even the last variant that we see. You know, viruses are meant to change. Viruses are meant to mutate. You know, they are under so much pressure that because they are RNA viruses, then they are subjected to mutation. But if the mutation occurs in a place that is affecting and that gives the virus the propensity to, to, to infect people more or to become, to become more invasive, of your immune system, then we end up in this situation. So I am not surprised, and then I can also say that, you know, that uh, as long as transmission continues, and that's what we're talking about, people avoiding to spread the virus by taking all of the necessary measures or getting vaccinated. As long as transmission continues, regardless of wherever we're in the world, the probability that we have new variant that could be more vulnerable and more damaging to even the present vaccine is, 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 is there. So, and that's the reason why we say less make sure that we take responsibility to prevent transmission to continue. Because as long as there is transmission, the virus will keep changing. And it's very possible that at some point the virus can change for the worse. So we are all responsible to prevent this pandemic from continuing. Well, in terms of all of our responsibility, I just want to ask this as we wind down on this topic, uh, Prof. There's still that challenge, and it's a question we ask every health professional. There's this, this challenge of the balance between lives and livelihood, health and economy, the personal economy of people, especially in a climate like ours. That is a critical challenge for all the authorities, including all of us who are supposed to take responsibility. What would be your counsel? Well, I think, as you mentioned, it's very difficult for, for our own economies and then, and then for us in Africa. Because, you know, there is uh, that balance that you need to create between life and livelihood. How do you do it? And I think that it's very difficult for people to, you know, to say, okay, we'll continue to get locked in the world. We'll continue to, you know, um, uh, I mean, uh, to, 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 to do the things that we, we've, not, we've not been doing before. But I think that there's a way to balance it. I think the government, both at federal and, 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 and state and then local level, should come up with a way of getting people to 
make their livelihood while protecting lives. And that way could be, for instance, to balance. Maybe you may just decide to, to, to open, you know, have some people open certain days while others are opening certain days, you know, try to get people into stores uh, by numbers. We're not saying that everywhere has to be locked down. You can decide to have maybe 100 people in a, in a, in a supermarket or in a mall at a time. And then, you know, there are ways where, we, where this could be balanced. It's going to be a little bit challenging, but at the same time, we can actually balance both. I think it's about setting the right policy and striking the, the right balance so that people can, can protect both life and their livelihood. Right, uh, Professor Christian Happy, we do appreciate your perspective this morning. Uh, Professor Director, African Center of uh, Excellence for Genomics of Infectious Diseases, the Redemus University. Prof, we do thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you for having me.